Greetings, Python coders. This is once again Alan D. Moore, and I am back to talk to you about Python classes. This is part three in our series on classes. In part one, I dispelled some myths around Python classes. In part two, we developed a class from scratch and talked about the syntax and the conventions and the concepts that you need to understand to work with classes. And now in part three, I want to answer a question that I see all the time, something that people struggle with when it comes to classes, and that is, how do I use classes? So in this video, I'm just going to look at five signs that you're likely to run into in your own code, uh, particularly beginner code that tends to be rather procedural. And we're going to look at how a class might actually improve that code. So sign number one, your code has implicitly related variables. Let's look at our example here. In this code, this is a competitive guessing game, really fun game here. And we start right off with some variables. We've got player one name, player one score, player one guesses, and then we have the same set of variables for player two. Now, any human being looking at this code would conclude that this is a two-player game, and we have name, score, and guesses for player one, and name, score, and guesses for player two. And we infer that all from the names of the variables. And of course, we're correct. But what we need to understand is that while this is obvious to a human, it is in no way obvious to Python. All right, as far as Python is concerned, there is no relation whatsoever between these variables. You could have called them Ronald Reagan and cheeseburger and uh, reggae music, and they'd be no less related in Python's eyes than what they are now. The fact that we use the same seven letters and an underscore at the beginning of each of these variable names is meaningless. And so what happens is, when we get down into our code, we've got this function here, get guess. And it takes a name, and it takes a score, it takes a number of guesses, and then it takes a secret number. And it gets a guess from the user, and if the user's guess is correct, the user gets a one point to their score. If the uh, number is wrong, then we subtract one from their number of guesses remaining. And then we have to return the score and the guesses because we modified them, and those will have to be assigned back to whatever variables we passed in. And gameplay starts right here. Okay, and you can see we have player one's turn here, player one score, player one guesses, player one name, player one score, guesses, secret number. We're passing all these things in, putting them back, and then we have the same thing for player two. And then at the end, of course, we figure out whose score is higher, or if everybody's is the same, and we say who won, if anyone won. Okay, let's go ahead and run this code and see how it works. So we've got Alice and Bob. Alice is going to guess correct guesses, or try to guess correct guesses. And Bob's going to be an idiot and guess 9 every time. Let's scroll this up. 9, 1... Nine, one. Okay, so what happened here is Alice is the only one who got a correct guess. And yet, at the end, game over and nobody won. Well, what happened here? Did, shouldn't Alice be the winner? Well, if you're sharp and you were looking at the code up here, you'll note that we have a bug. Right here, instead of returning our output from get guess to player two score, we returned it to player one score, which means that Alice's score was being overwritten with Bob's every time Bob took a guess. So under certain situations, even though Alice got more points, she wouldn't win. And that's not really fair, is it? So this is a very simple bug, but because of our our code and the way it works, because we have to take responsibility for keeping these variables associated and related, it's very easy to put in a bug like this. 
And this is something I'm going to say for all these examples. Imagine a much more complex program, right? This is a very simple example, but imagine a more complex situation with a lot more rules and a lot more functions. How easy it would be for everything to get out of sync with just one simple character being wrong. Well, now let's look at a class-based version and let's see how that will help us. Okay, so in this case, we acknowledge the elephant in the room and we create a class called player because there is such a thing as a player in the game. And inside of its init function, we create some instance variables. We have a name, guesses, and a score. Okay, and then because our get guess function primarily is used to manipulate those variables, those instance variables, we're going to make it an instance method. We're bringing it into the class, and as you can see, we can now modify the instance variables directly inside that method. And we have access to all that. We don't have to worry about manually shuttling all those variables together um, and keeping things connected. So now down here in the gameplay, we've created a couple of player objects, and now when we when we want to get a guess, we just run player1.getGuess, and all we have to do is pass in the secret number. There is no way that player2's instance variables are going to be modified during the running of this instance method. There's no way player1's instance variables are going to be modified during the running of this instance method. So not only has this cleaned up our code a bit, but this has made it a lot more reliable. We are no longer in any danger of uh, accidentally assigning the wrong score or the wrong number of guesses. So remember that is what we call implicitly related variables. Look for things like this in your code and that will help you avoid a lot of bugs if you convert that to classes. Okay, sign number two is kind of the opposite problem and that is your data is overloaded. So what have we got here? We have a simulator for the card game War, which is about the simplest card game ever. If you don't know that game, it's basically two people drawing cards from a deck and whoever's card is higher wins the round. And you just play on and on and on until you get bored of it uh, or you run out of cards. So in our War simulation without classes, We've created a deck of cards, and that deck is simply a list of strings. And each string is two characters. One is the rank, and one is the suit. Okay? And then we have a function down here to compare cards to see which one's higher. And that function has been written so that it pulls the first character right here to determine the rank. It then turns rank into a numeric value, okay, by either pulling from this list using the letter cards or just converting the numeric ranks into an int. And then down here in our gameplay, it's pretty simple. We shuffle the deck, and then for every turn until we run out of cards, we just pop a card off the deck and we compare the cards. All right, let's just run that. Let's see what the output looks like. Okay, kind of looks like that. That just simulates a game. Now what's wrong with this code? So look at the way my cards are. Um, I have decided to represent cards as a two character string, of course. And that means that for the most part it works, but look what happens when I get to 10. I can't use 10 for my rank because it can only be one character, so I've had to use X. And that works fine, but it's a little confusing for somebody reading the output. What is the X card? I don't know what the X card is. Um, of course, if you know your Roman numerals, maybe it'll, it'll dawn on you, oh, that's 10. Okay, but it's not really optimal for display. I could change that. I could maybe use a delimiter. Maybe I could add a space. Uh, maybe I could put a colon or a comma in there, and then we wouldn't have to be stuck with one character for the rank, 
But that would make my compare cards function a whole lot more complicated. And again, this is a very simple card game. Imagine if we were implementing a much more complicated card game with a lot more functions. So that would exponentially increase um, the amount of code I'm running to determine the value of a card. There are certainly ways we could fix this without using a class, but the point I want you to see here is that we currently have a battle. We have competing interests for how our cards are represented. Um, the, the way that we're representing them for display and the way that we're representing them for actually doing calculations in the program are at odds. If we optimize for display, we're going to make our calculations more complex. If we optimize for calculations, we're going to be more limited with our display. So how would a class help? In the class-based version, I've created a class called card. And I've specified that cards can have these ranks and these suits. These are class attributes. And then I've made a class method that will return a deck using a list comprehension. And when we create a card, we go ahead and not only take the suit and the rank, but we calculate a value using this class attribute. And we store that as part of the card. So in, in effect, we can store metadata about these cards. For display, we can override the dunder string function, the magic method that controls how this will be cast to a string, and we can put whatever we want. So I've got the rank of suit as my template for displaying a card, and I could do anything else I want, and it wouldn't affect anything else in this code. Finally, I can override the GT dunder method, which determines the behavior of this class when it's used with a greater than symbol. And I could also, if I wanted to be complete, have defined the LT, which is less than, and the EQ, which is equals, but I only needed the greater than for this game. So now in our gameplay, first of all, it's a, it's a bit cleaner. We aren't making a function call. We're just using an operator. We're saying if player one card is greater than player two card. And then we don't have to do anything special with our display. We can just put in the card variable, and it'll display the way we want it to. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and see the output of that. So that's a little bit nicer. So again, you could argue that we could have done this without a class, but it would have been a lot uglier code. Um, and we would still have that competing interest between the representation that we use for calculations and the representation that we use for displaying to the user. And using the class eliminates that contention because we're able to store the basic metadata about a card and then use that metadata appropriately to generate either calculations or display for the user without having to get overly complicated. All right, so maybe during that last example, you were saying, well, I can see why a string would be bad, but you could have done all that with a tuple or with a dictionary or a list or something like that and kept all that metadata together that way. Well, let's talk about that approach because that brings us to sign number three, and that is your data structures have implicit requirements. Okay, so I have a little piece of payroll software here, and it starts out with a list of dictionaries that keeps all of my employee data together. Then I've got a list of tuples that has all my raise data. Next, I've got a couple of functions. One is apply anniversary, and that simply increments the number of years the employee has worked for the company. Then I have a function maybe apply raise, and it takes an employee and a list of raise tuples, and it extracts each one and checks if the employee has that position and has that number of years at the company. And if so, it adjusts the employee's salary um, by a certain amount and prints a little message. Okay. And then down here at the bottom, of course, we 
loop through the employees, we apply the anniversary function, and then we check to see if the employee gets a raise. Well, let's run this. As you can see, Alice, lucky Alice, gets a raise of $5,000, and Bob Butler gets no raise. All right, well, let's look at our data, though, real quick. So Bob Butler is a sales agent and has worked for the company for two years. And our raises say that sales agents who work for the company for three years get a raise. But since we're applying our anniversary to this list of employees before we check raises, Bob should have three years with the company and he should get a raise. Let's find out why. You probably noticed, maybe you noticed, and the problem is right here. When we apply the anniversary, instead of applying it back to years, somebody made a typo, and instead we're creating a new key in that dictionary called years. And years is going to be one more than the number of years, but that's irrelevant because down here in the apply raise, we're checking years, and years has not gotten updated. So if we were to fix that and then run the code, we would see that Bob Butler properly gets his raise of 2250. So that's one problem is that your dictionaries do not enforce any sort of structure. If you want to add a key, they'll happily do it, okay? We don't get the kind of data security that we need from a dictionary. But there's another problem. It's a little more subtle. So our code has been written with the assumption that a raise tuple has three, exactly three, elements and that they are position, amount, and years. Well, let's say that HR comes to us and says, you know, we'd also like to factor in, say, an employee's review score, and uh, we want you to add in a minimum score for each position that is required for them to get a raise. So we're going to have to add something else to this tuple. Right? So we would add this number in, and now this code is broken. We're going to get an error. You'll see that. Okay, too many values to unpack. So this code was written with an assumption about this raises structure, which is not written anywhere in the code, but as soon as we change that structure, it breaks. And of course, we could fix that, but if imagine if this was part of a much more complicated piece of payroll software, we would have to fix that for every single function that uses these uh, tuples. How can a class help us? Can a class do anything for us? Let's see. So down here, I've implemented this with classes, and I'm using a few features of the class to show you how we can have some good enforcement of data security. So right off the bat, I'm defining raise as a class, and I'm doing something that's kind of a new feature here of Python 3.7, and that is the data class. And this is just a simple shorthand way to create a class uh, that essentially takes a bunch of arguments in its init function and assigns them to instance variables. So when we create an instance of this class, we would pass in a string of position, we'd pass in a raise percent and the number of years required, and those would all be assigned to instance variables of the same name. In that way, it's a little more explicit in terms of here's what a raise consists of. For our employee class, we're creating a new employee, and here again we specified first, last salary, position, and number of years. And as you can see, since this is a function and not just a, a literal in the code, we can use things like assert. We can assert that our salary is an integer. Uh, we can assert that our position is in this list of positions that we know exist. We can assert that year is an integer. And we can do all these kind of things so that our program will stop and throw an error if we get a bad piece of data, which is actually what we want, because we'd rather crash and have to fix our program than have angry bobs showing up at our office wondering why they didn't get raises. Okay, also we have the apply anniversary here, and I want you to notice that 
we haven't actually fixed the bug of you know, this potentially being reversed just by using a class. So a class will actually happily assign any instance variable you want, just like a dictionary will. However, classes have a feature that we can use called slots. This is a magic attribute. We talked about magic methods in the last video. We didn't talk about magic attributes. But this is a magic attribute, and it just takes a tuple of strings. And if it's defined, it limits the attributes that can be defined to what is in this list. So now, if I have this code like this, and I'm going to run it down here, I'm going to get an error that employee object has no attribute, attribute years. That's because. I added this slots method. And that's uh, a great feature that can really help our data security in classes and make sure that we're not doing things like this and assigning random instance variables. Okay, so I'm going to fix that, run this again, and now you can see my raises work. So that gives you an idea of the additional data security we can get from using classes and also we have a record in the code of explicitly what belongs with an employee record. So before, we would say things like, you know, this function takes an employee. But employee was never formally defined in the code. It was just sort of implicitly defined by looking at these dictionaries. But of course, in a real program, these dictionaries probably wouldn't actually be in the code. They would be read in from a database or read in from a, a file or something like that. So it's nice that our object gives us documentation of what an actual employee object is expected to be. And so when we pass it to a function or when we write a method for it, we know exactly what fields are available and we can document what they should be. We can enforce what they should be and we don't have to worry about um, accidentally creating new instance variables or things like that. All right, let's move on. So sign number four, your high level code is too low level. Now this may not be the right wording for this sign. I know that we talk about high level and low level languages. Um, and so, you know, low level languages are like assembly or C that deal closely with the hardware and the memory management, things like that, as opposed to a high level language like Python. I'm not really talking about that. What I'm talking about is that when you write code, there is sort of the big picture code, like what is the program really doing from the 5,000 foot view? And then there's detail code, like how does this specific task get done? For example, I've got this ratio multiplier script, which takes a bunch of pairs, or it takes a bunch of ratios, and here are these ratios are expressed as tuples and they're in pairs and it's going to go through and multiply each of those ratios and show me the product. So that's my big picture code. My big picture code is take each pair of ratios, multiply them and print out what the product was. But I've also got some detail code. For example, how exactly do we multiply ratios? And that's all here in this multiply ratios function. And how do we display ratios? We don't want to see ratios as a tuple. We want to see them like we're used to seeing ratios, which would be a couple of numbers separated by a colon. So down here in my actual code where the, where the execution really begins, okay, I've got this multiply ratios function being called. You know, and that's not bad. It's not quite as nice as we might like it to be. But then in my, my string, in my F string, I've got all this ugly code to format my ratios. So this is what I mean by my high level code is too low level. There's too much detail junk here in my high level code. It makes it harder to understand what's actually happening in this for loop. And of course, this is a simple example. You need to imagine if this was a much more complex operation. Well, let's go down here and let's use a class. And the first thing we're going to do when we use a class is we're going to explain to Python, 
here's what a ratio is. So a ratio has an antecedent and a consequent. We assign those as instance variables. And then next, rather than have a separate function for multiplying ratios, we can use the Dunder MUL method to define what it means when we multiply ratio objects. And that's you know the same algorithm. We multiply the antecedents, we multiply the consequence, we get the uh, greatest common denominator, and we divide it out to reduce our ratio. And then I can use the Dunder string method to decide how my ratios are going to look when I use them in a string. And then the result down here is very clean. So this is my high level code, right? This is my big picture code right here. And look how clean it is. I get my ratio pairs and I simply multiply them using the multiplication operator. That's very readable. And when I print them, I simply put them in, right here into my, uh, my template string just with the object name. I'm not formatting them at all. I think you'd have to agree that this really cleans up my high-level code. We tucked all the nastiness down in this class, and even then it's not quite as nasty as uh, what we've got here. And that just looks a lot nicer. So something to think about if you've just got a lot of ugly code like this. Maybe use a class and just clean that up. Okay, the last sign. You have many functions that branch based on a value. So in this example, I've written a little interactive system administration tool that supports multiple operating systems. And we start out by detecting our operating system using the platform.system function from the standard library. And then I've defined some callbacks here, list files, list processes, list TCP network. And in each function, I am branching based on the detected operating system. And I'm running an appropriate command using subprocess and decoding the uh, output based on what OS it is. So UTF-8 for Linux and Mac OS and ASCII for Windows. And of course, we always have to handle the case of an unknown OS. Maybe they're running it on Haiku or BSD or something else that we haven't written support for. Okay, so that goes through in every function. And you can just see from looking at this, there's a lot of repetitive code here. All right, and then this is our actual interface. We just print out the options, we get the selection, we call the callback. All right, that's pretty simple. But the problem is here, of course, in all this branching, it's very hard to see what's actually going on. The actual differences between all of these branches are kind of buried down in the code. So how can a class help? So we're going to take advantage of inheritance with classes in this case. We're going to create a class called command backend and it's going to have some class attributes here. Uh, ls command, ps command, tcp command, and these will just be lists that can be passed into subprocess. Um, and then it will have an encoding specified. Okay, And we've defined the run command method and that will take a command which will be just a single character that came in from our UI and it will map that to one of those lists that we defined up here and pass that into subprocess. Then it will decode the output from subprocess using the proper encoding. Now to create backends for our different operating systems, all we have to do is subclass command backend and override these attributes uh, with the proper commands. So here we can see that on Mac OS, the ls command is just ls. The ps command is ps with the arguments of aux. Uh, the tcp command is netstat uh, with the t flag. All right, on Linux, our ls command is ls, our ps command is ps with a flag of dash e, tcp command is ss with a flag of t. On Windows, we're using dir, task list, netstat, and our encoding has been overridden to be ASCII. 
Okay, then we create a dictionary here that will map our detected operating system platform to a back end. And we determine the correct back end class. We call it to create an instance of our back end. And now it's very simple. We just say back end run command. So this is a whole lot cleaner. We're not repeating ourselves. We're not doing big chains of if and elif. All right, we're simply grabbing the correct back end and all of the necessary code to handle the different platform is tied into that back end. There are a few other signs I could mention uh, that would help you determine that you might want to look into using a class such as overuse of global variables or uh, if you're having a hard time splitting a script into multiple files. But those are a little more esoteric. I think these five signs are good ones to start looking at your code right now and finding ways that you can use classes and getting used to, to using them. I hope this has been helpful. Um, for now, this will be the last video in this series on classes unless I get some good questions and feedback, in which case I might do a Q&A episode or address a specific uh, concern with classes. Hope you found this educational. Uh, spread the word. Let's get some more people uh, watching these videos and being helped by them. Uh, in the meantime, please check out my books in the description and uh, have a lot of fun coding and God bless.